Hello and welcome everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Kelly here with Esri and I want to welcome you all to our webinar. So today we're going to be discussing ArcGIS Survey123 for Census and Statistics. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Linda Peters and the rest of our presenters today to introduce themselves and get us started. Linda? Yeah, thanks so much, Kelly. Great to be here with everyone again today. Uh, my name is Linda Peters. I'm in global business development here at Esri, and my focus is working with official statistics agencies. So i um, really glad to see many statisticians and, and folks from Census here with us in the audience. I'll uh, pass it over to my colleague, Kate. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kate. I'm a solution engineer on our mapping statistics and land administration team. So I also work with national statistics offices, uh, supporting from the more technical side. Great. Matthew. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Matt, also a solution engineer on the Mapping, Statistics, and Land Administration uh, National Government team. And just like Kate, I support from the technical side uh, for large mapping agencies. Back over to you, Linda. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And um, we are going to turn cameras off as we're talking. Uh, some of us suffer bandwidth issues, as, as many of you do as well. So forgive us for that. We'll come back on camera at the end for the Q&A session. But right now, what I want to do is go over the agenda with you um, and then uh, dive right in. So again, today, what we're going to start talking about first is Survey123 for Census and Statistics. Um, Survey123 is being used more and more in in census work, um, both in pre-enumeration planning as well as in the actual enumeration. So we're going to uh, touch on both of those areas. We'll also touch on optimization of enumeration areas, so really walking through the full workflow. Um, then I'm going to invite my colleagues, uh, Matt and Kate, to show you some of these examples. And at the end, again, we'll open it up for questions. We'll do a couple of poll questions along the way. So um, hope you stay with us and participate as we go. So I always start with ArcGIS because it's all about the ArcGIS platform. That's where things begin. And many of you know already that this is a comprehensive platform. It's open, it's services-based, it's extendable. And it supports not only large organizations, but teams and teams out in the field as well. And it provides us with a smarter way to perform tasks such as planning, establishing the foundation for our work, doing that data collection out in the field and monitoring and reporting on operations as we go. Many organizations today are working to produce official statistics and you're looking to become more efficient in that data capture to support your mission. Um, oftentimes capturing that data in the field is the backbone of your success and Survey123 can help you to collect that data, become more efficient in the process and maintain or even improve your accuracy level and we'll uh, show you a little bit about that shortly. Survey123 really is a complete form-centric system for your organization, so let's take a look at what I mean by that. And I do want to just touch on the, the generic statistical business process model for a moment, because in our work, we're often tasked with key functions to help us prepare for collection in the field, that we not only have to design our database, our frame, but design the collection. We have to build the instrument. We have to run the collection. And Survey123 can help us in many ways in this process. Now, the way that Survey123 works is it provides us with many tools to create the survey instrument, to collect the data, and then, of course, get answers to our questions, to, to monitor the process, to analyze the results even helping us make decisions in near real time, perhaps making adjustments on areas where enumerators are having difficulty in getting response levels anticipated. And there are several components to the system, and, and we'll look at most of these today. First, as I mentioned earlier, it starts with ArcGIS. So we need an organization to store the form and the data. We need then to use the designer to build the survey. This can be done in a browser, or if it's a complex survey, we might want to use an XLS form. 
We then have a website that lets us view the ongoing work. And of course, the app itself or the, the tablet, the smart device to collect the data. Now, why would you use Survey123? There's many uh, CAPI uh, different options, but Survey123 really truly helps you streamline your work and helps you move, um, perhaps if you're in a, a PAPI mode last time from PAPI to CAPI, or just make your existing digital form work smarter. It can help you reduce errors, and uh, Kate and Matt will both touch on this as they're showing us different forms. It helps us, again, with our efficiency and, and transforming our work. Um, we can do things such as pre-populate responses, uh, give pick lists, uh, do intelligent um, links and other things. So we'll look at some of the workflow automation tools that are included. Now, Survey123 is built with the ArcGIS App Studio. It provides real-time data collection. The survey data are immediately available for visualization and analysis. Um, I say that, that's if you're connected. If you're disconnected, it's stored and then transmitted when you're back to a connection point. Once the data is transmitted, all data is stored in ArcGIS and feature services. And this is important because it allows us to do other things. We can use that data across the platform. We can feed that data into a dashboard to have that status, to understand what's going on, or perhaps even integrate it with other apps. Um, for example, if you were to use Survey123 for your pre-enumeration demarcation to collect the building level information, you could immediately access that data from a geodatabase in another form for use in the actual enumeration or count. And on the right of the screen, you'll see an example of this uh, application being used in that demarcation process. Um, here uh, showing how they can simply uh, use their finger to draw on the device to delineate the enumeration area and indicate the households that should be included into that EA. So a couple of other things, uh, because there is so much you can do with Survey123, there's a lot of automation that can be done. I know there's a, a lot of developers out there who are saying, what can I do with this myself? Um, you can automate it with web hooks. You can use Survey123 for developers, um, customizing your own version. Um, there's a web app, JavaScript API. There's a feature report API. Um, many other different tools, as you see here. And of course, multi-language support. Uh, the example on the right you see here is another function allowing us, for example, to limit the size of the photo that's actually being uploaded. So there's a lot to take a look at. And with that, what I want to do is get us ready to uh, bring Kate and Matthew up. But I think, Kelly, we're going to do a first poll question. Yes, thank you, Linda. And everyone should be seeing that poll question on their screen. So we appreciate your feedback. And the first question we're asking, are you interested in or already using GIS and census workflows in your organization? And if you could please select one um, that best fits your answer. So we have the first option, yes, you're brand new to using GIS. Yes, you've already been using it for more than 24 months. No, but you're interested to begin in the next six to 12. No, but plan to begin in maybe more than 12 months. And no, but you're doing research now uh, to make an informed decision. Okay, and it looks like 38% uh, of you have been using GIS for more than 24 months, um, followed by no, but you're doing research now to make that informed decision and then closely with uh, yes, and you're brand new to using GIS. So again, thank you for your participation. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to our next presenter. Yeah, thanks. Um, Kate, uh, we'll serve it over to you. So now that we've kind of gone through the introduction, we wanna get to actually showing you how this all works in action. So today we're gonna show ArcGIS as a complete system for your population survey. We're gonna walk through how you can start from high resolution imagery, extract building footprints, identify in the field which buildings are residential and occupied, and then divide them into balanced enumeration areas so that you can manage the population census. And finally, we'll show how you can use ArcGIS to monitor the enumeration in progress 
tracking the data as it's submitted in a dashboard like this. So here we have elements that are connected to the building points in the map, allowing us to keep track of the progress in near real time, including seeing how many households have been surveyed in each enumeration area and which buildings we're gonna need to revisit. Our first step in this process, before we can get to monitoring the data collection in the field, is we need to determine where to count. If I have building points from previous surveys, we can convert those to a feature service and validate them in the field to create a complete and accurate building inventory. But in this scenario, for the Caribbean nation of Grenada, we don't have any existing data, so we're going to extract building polygons from imagery. When I'm starting from imagery, I'm going to train and run a deep learning model to recognize the rooftops and create a polygon for each building. So when I zoom in, you can see this is really high resolution imagery and we can identify just in the image itself where the building rooftops are. And this comes a little bit more in focus here. And we're gonna create a deep learning model to extract the building rooftops. So deep learning is a process where I'll teach a model to recognize the specific features like the rooftops, and then it will scan through the imagery to identify all of the buildings. I can do what's usually a very complex process with just a few geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS Pro. For this imagery, I'll start by creating training samples by drawing rectangles around each building rooftop. I'll do this for a number of different examples of rooftops in the imagery so that the model is going to know exactly what to look for when it's going through to identify all of the rooftops. And I'll do this in a few different areas of the imagery, making sure to capture all the different appearances of, build, of rooftops, so getting the different shapes and different colors so that the model knows what it's supposed to be looking for. Once I've created a large subset of training data, I can bring that in to our train deep learning model geoprocessing tool. So here I'll input my training data that I've just created, and then I'll pair that with a backbone model. So we've created pre-trained models uh, available through the Living Atlas, which are gonna simplify the process of extracting features from imagery. These models include building footprint extraction, and we have one version that's trained off of building footprints in the USA, and another version that's trained off of building footprints in Africa. There are over 20 different um, deep learning models available through the Living Atlas, and these are carefully trained by the experts on our GOAI team. So you can utilize them in your own work to speed up the process and make, give you a more accurate result where you don't have to create as much training data, or none at all. So when I go back to my map, once I've trained my deep learning model just by adding in my training samples, and pairing it with a pre-trained model, I can go into the detect objects using deep learning tool. And here, all I need to do is input my imagery and then load in my model. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be using the, um, we're gonna be using one of the Living Atlas deep learning models. It's gonna be building footprint extraction. So once I've found that and loaded it in here, we can run the model and I'll zoom out to show the result. So here we've identified all of the building footprints for the entire country of Grenada using this pre-trained deep learning model. After running it for the whole country, I'll have the building polygons, and now we have a base that we can use to go out into the field and validate the captured buildings. Before I send people out into the field, I'm gonna run one more tool so if we could, if we wanted to, we could work with just these building polygons. But in this case, I'm gonna input the building footprints and run the feature to point tool so that we can have a building point for each building that we'll use instead of the polygons to drive our Survey123 app when we go out into the field. So now I'm going to show you how I can use the Survey123 app in the field with these points driving the data collection. And all the information that we capture in the field is going to be associated back to these features on the map. So when I open up Survey123, I can select our building survey points form. And the inbox is gonna show me all of the building points that I've been assigned. 
So in this first view, I can see a list of all the different building points, and I can sort it in order of the building ID number or by the building that I'm closest to. So this can help if I'm walking around out in the field to orient myself to the closest building. I can also view my assigned points in the map. So here I'll have loaded in the high resolution imagery for reference, as well as our enumeration area boundaries. And when I zoom in further, I'll be able to see that we have the building polygons as a base. When I get to a building that I want to collect data for, I can select it on the map. And when I open it up, I'll see that some of our data has already been associated with this building polygon. So I already have the parish number, the enumeration district number, and the building number. And I can proceed to add additional information, like the date I'm conducting the survey, the community name, which is filtered based on which parish that I'm in. I can collect further information about the building. And then importantly, I'll get the building type. So if this is an institution, I can collect some basic information about it. Or if this is a residential building, I can capture how many dwellings are within it. And if each of these dwellings is vacant or if it's occupied, I can get additional information about the household itself. Once I've filled out this form, capturing all the information that's associated with this building, I can submit it. And then I'll see this assignment disappear from my map. So now that building polygon is no longer selectable because I've already collected the data. And I can move on to the next building point on my map. Once I've finished going through all of the building polygons that have been assigned to me, I've captured basic information about all of the buildings. The GIS analyst that's back in the office can go in and update our enumeration areas based on the information that I just collected so that we have so that we're ready to go out into the field for the population census. And today, Matt is going to be playing the role of that GIS analyst. So I'll pass the presentation over to him so he can go through that process. Thank you very much, Kate. So I'm back in, I'm back in the office, and I know that as a census planner, you do not have an easy task. You need to break down your region of responsibility into manageable pieces, while also looking at it holistically to make sure you will be dividing the work equitably. The good news is that this is actually a common business and logistical challenge, and we can apply many of the same tools that commercial businesses use to plan their sales territories to help us plan for and conduct offenses more efficiently. To create the enumeration areas, we're going to use the territory design solution tools found in the business analyst tool set in ArcGIS Pro. But before we get started, let's take a look at my map. On my map, I have the building centroids collected from the building inventory Kate showed just a bit ago. I also have hydro or drainage lines and a reference layer to reference my road network. Taking a look at the attribute table of the center points, I see that we have an attribute called number of dwellings. This attribute was collected by the building inventory. So now that we have an understanding of the geometry and the attributes that we have, let's start building the enumeration areas. We start with the new territory design solution found underneath the analysis tab in the business analyst workflow group. We use the building centroids as our input features. And I'll follow a few parameters here. So the default territory name allows me to provide a, a number that will increase incrementally and have a default numeration in front. I'm not filling up the boundary mask, but if I wanted to, or if I have like a larger area, uh, I could limit the extent of my territory solution. So larger nations have uh, multiple provinces or regions where it would make sense to build a solution per province because of the different geography concerns and computer processing speeds. In a smaller country like Grenada, this isn't required. 
So now we have a new group of feature classes. And a new contextual tab to work with the solution. My center points have been loaded in the territory solution, but I want you to notice that they are all the same color. So we haven't divided them up into enumeration areas. Let's get to that part. So the first thing we need to do is we're actually going to work left to right uh, on this analysis tab right here. So the first thing we'll do is we'll add a variable. Our variable is going to be the number of dwellings. And we're going to set that as a summary statistic, so we want to be able to add them up. And we'll add that level of variable to our solution. The next thing you want to set up is the constraints of that attribute. So again, choosing number of dwellings, we're going to set a limit for the, the growth of the enumeration areas. So with this being a more populated area, I'm going to select 200 dwellings as my minimum. My maximum will be 300 dwellings. And say an ideal value would be 250. I'm going to give that 100% of the weight. The weight list is determine how we want to balance these variables. In this case, we only have one variable, so it's not that important. But the next step is to balance the variables. In this case, we have number of dwellings, and it will get 100% of the weight. The next option I want to take a look at is barriers. If necessary, we could use the road network as a barrier to stop the growth of the enumeration areas. In this case, I'm working on an island, and my simple road network doesn't call out any of the major roads, so I'm going to skip it. The next step would be then to solve the territories. Since I don't know how many territories I need, I'm going to set the number of territories as optimal. So based on my attribute constraints and my balance variable, it's going to grow this for me. As this can be an iterative process, I may want to adjust the quality or the, essentially the speed of the solution. Making it lower makes the solution faster, but maybe less accurate. And making it higher makes it run a little bit slower, but more accurate. So in the interest of time, I've already ran, a few, ran this solution. So once we run the solution, we notice that the points become color-coded. Each point has been assigned to an enumeration area. But I want to take advantage of the ArcGIS system's location awareness to automatically update my CAPP form. So I need, air to, I need areas for that. The Territory Solutions tool has it solved. So I'm going to use a tool called Create Feature Classes. And inside there are four defaults. The first default is what I'm looking for, the territory boundaries. Running this solution will group my territories or group my points into specific boundaries. So now each enumeration area is linked to a geography on the ground. One of the benefits of this is that these are also topologically correct. So there's no overlaps or gaps or slivers. We can also get an idea of how well the areas are balanced by looking at a chart. So we can see that our enumeration areas did a pretty good job. We have no territories that have over 300 buildings, and most of them are fitting well within the range of 250 to 200. Again, this is an iterative process, so we can continue to run this as many times as we need to get our solution. As you can see here, if we had a road network, we would probably stop the growth of this one to make it more streamlined against the road. Okay, so that's how we would uh, balance these enumeration areas. And now that we have those areas defined, let's talk about designing the survey form for optimization as well. You can just see countries embrace the use of CAPI census forms. This is great. But what we see also is that they simply recreate the paper form, but just in a digital format. As Linda alluded to, with Survey123, we have the opportunity to optimize these forms. Optimization lowers the burden on the enumerator in the field, leading to more efficient collection and a higher level of data integrity, which then in turn leads to less effort spent on data cleanup and decreasing the time to dissemination. The end result is a more efficient census operation. Let's take a look at the census form for Grenada. 
almost all countries have a form very similar to this one. And immediately we can see the benefit of a cabbie based census. All this stuff right here, using the proper pencil, filling in the form correctly without touching the boundaries, filling in the check boxes appropriately, erasing cleanly and making no stray marks in this form. All of those things are alleviated by using a CAPI form. Scrolling down, we can see another benefit that Survey123 can take care of. This information here, the parish, the enumeration district, building number, and household number, can all be filled in automatically using the spatial awareness of the application. Scrolling out a little bit further, we get to the household roster. This is one of the most essential portions of the census. This ensures that we count everyone. And while we normally would fill this out with, a, with paper and pencil, we can keep the names on this list in this roster in memory and then use them when it comes to questions like these. Notice that there is an ellipse right here. I can then transfer the name using Survey123 into this question. So enumerators do not need to flip pages to find the correct name. Enumerators can't accidentally skip someone. And while it's not measurable, but still important for the human connection, the enumerator can refer to people in the household by name rather than number. One more thing I want to point out is these go-to instructions. Using the logic in Survey123, we can make sure that only relevant questions are being asked. This improves data collection accuracy and preserves screen real estate to streamline filling out the form. So now that we have an idea of what we can improve, let's see how we do improve it. To optimize the census forms, we want to use ArcGIS Survey 123 Connect. This provides the necessary tools and exposes the background logic we can leverage to make the form's middle process as seamless as possible. The first thing we want to do is enable that inbox feature that Kate showed us. That's actually a, a built-in functionality of ArcGIS Survey 123. All you need to do to enable the inbox is turn it on. So there you go. It's an out-of-the-box function, and it, that's it. The RA inbox is enabled, and now our enumerators will know exactly which buildings they need to visit. We can assign them uh, based on their location. All right, so let's employ some of that optimization logic. So in ArcGIS Survey 123 Connect, the XLSF form is exposed. And this format contains a ton of built-in logic in a familiar Excel spreadsheet environment. Across the top, there are a bunch of field names. They each refer to a configuration component of ArcGIS Survey 123. Right now, I'm gonna focus on the name and label fields. When you fill out the name, you are building a data schema behind the scenes. And the label, is how the question will appear in the form. Now, the goal of the census is to count everyone. So to make sure we do that, we're going to use something called repeat logic. So here's a type of question called a repeat, and it's going to group all of these questions together. But how many times do I need to repeat that question? Well, there's a column called repeat count. And you can see here that we are referring to the number of dwellings which actually is a attribute inside the schema. So using that number, I can control how many times that form or those questions will be repeated. So I can ensure that everybody is being counted and nothing gets skipped. I also want to take a look a little bit more at the individual questionnaire. So using that same logic, we can pass the information of the total people in the household to make sure the repeat count matches every single person inside the household. So those are some numerical, numerical things, but we can also pass text as well. This logic comes out of the box with the forms and the new versions of ArcGIS Survey 123. This used to involve a custom JavaScript on the back end, but in this case, it says it's built already into the form. So let's take a look at this name field. So this is a textual description, but we can actually pass it in later on questions so each person can be referred to by name.
let's take a one, let's take a look at a few more logical things. Let's scroll over to the relevant field. So I mentioned earlier that we can use logic to determine which questions are being asked and when. So these questions here are only relevant if the previous question is answered to be true. That way we don't need to waste our time reading the form about saying which go to which question we need to go to. It'll automatically pop up. This helps the num enumerator be more efficient. And so scrolling down, we can see even more relevancy questions or more relevancy being applied. We can see that logic can be applied based on the age or based on gender type. And those are just a few examples. So I could go on and on about the possibilities of all the logic, but I'm excited to show you how this form handles. This is a live form on my mobile device. Typing the inbox that we set up brings up a listing of all the buildings in my queue, and tapping on that listing brings up my form. Since the form is location aware, it will pre-populate any information from the building survey and fill out my username based on my identity in the ArcGIS Online organization. And this is how I know which forms I filled out and which forms I'm responsible for. And at a supervisor level, I know which forms are associated with which enumerator. So let's see how this form handles here. So we can see here that it's pre-populated with the number of housing units. In this case, it's just one. We're going to automatically fill out the time. And looking at the housing unit questionnaire, we can see it's one of one. That logic that we employed will ensure that this housing unit questionnaire can only be asked or gone through one time based on the number of housing units. Look at the number of people in this household. We'll say three. Based on that, we'll see that the, or the individual questionnaire can not only be answered three times one for each person. Filling out the name, you can see that that text is then going to be passed on to the next question. What is Matt's status within the household? I, I usually live here and I'm obviously the head of the household. Looking to the logic question about where I was born, I can say that yes, I was born in Grenada. In that case, the parish question opens up. So we can see how the logic makes the form pretty easy to fill out and reduces some of the burden on the surveyor and the enumerator. So I'm gonna go ahead and submit that form and then pass it over to Kate to show us what it looks like in the dashboard. Thanks, Matt. So now we're coming back to the dashboard where we started, but this time we're seeing in the dashboard a little bit more about the progress that's been made um, for the actual survey. So now we're showing buildings that have already been surveyed with a full white outline and buildings that have been visited but need to be revisited because maybe we only uh, surveyed one of the households within the building and we're showing those with a dotted outline so that it immediately flags it that this is a building that needs to be revisited. We also have other elements in this dashboard. I mentioned before that we can keep track of the number of surveys that have been completed in each enumeration area, but we could also show in this, uh, in this bar graph the number of surveys that have been completed by each enumerator. So we could keep track of our most or least productive enumerators, and compare how many surveys they're completing in a day to see what's a realistic expectation and if we're on track to complete our enumeration on the scheduled timeline. We also have elements like this that are being calculated on the fly as more data is being submitted. So we can see how many households on average that we have per building. And again, we're keeping track of how many households we need to revisit so that we can keep that in mind when we're planning the timeline for the completion of the rest of the enumeration. And these are just a few examples of the type of elements you could include in a dashboard for monitoring your population survey. We have many more um, types of elements that you could include if you wanted to keep track of the progress and compare uh, just the last 24 hours to the past week, for example. 
So anything that you would want to keep an eye on as enumeration is uh, taking place. So at this point, we've shown a full end-to-end -end solution for your population survey that's saving you time at each step, from the pre-enumeration planning to the data collection, balancing your enumeration area boundaries, collecting data in the field, monitoring your timeline, monitoring your enumeration, and then ultimately this can be brought into dissemination of your data. So this process is saving you money in training your staff and speeding up the turnaround time from collecting data to getting out into the field or from planning your enumeration to getting out into the field to collect data and ultimately to getting your data to decision makers. With that, I can pass things back to Kelly. Uh, thank you all for your time and we can start to do a poll question and then take some questions. All right, thank you so much, Kate and Matt. Uh, we have another poll question for you. And hopefully you see that just pop up on your screen. Uh, so again, we always appreciate your participation. So we will leave this poll open for about 30 seconds to get your answers in. And for this question, what area would you be most interested in learning more about census operations? And in this case, you can select uh, all that applies. So you can select more than one answer. So the first option, building the foundation, aka creating the base map, enumeration area design and optimization, capturing building level inventory, configuring survey for actual count, or operation support via dashboards. And it looks like it's pretty split across the board. So we have, let's see, I think the highest there is 63% of you are looking that are interested in operation support via dashboards, um, but it's pretty close. We have enumeration area design and optimization, and then the other three options close behind that. Um, so again, we appreciate your participation in that. And with this, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Linda Peters for the rest of the presentation. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to wrap us up here and talk a little bit about the challenges we face. And uh, we're all facing the same things these days with smaller budgets and, and fewer staff. You know, timelines seem to be pressed now more than ever, and yet the demand for information in, in near real time uh, continues to go up, and, and the demand on better resolution, better quality data, and of course, you know, in census and statistics, it's all about privacy as well, so balancing all of those is, is really a big challenge today. Um, as we think about what we just saw today with the use of Survey123, we can begin to get more responsive. We uh, are leveraging this technology and expanding our ability to increase, uh, you know, the analysis of the data, the optimization, like you saw with the enumeration area balancing. Um, we're leveraging the technology. You know, we've got faster GPU and computing power today. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this analysis with imagery and extracting features things we wouldn't have thought possible a few years ago. And of course, the field data collection itself, allowing us to speed the time that we're getting information into decision makers' hands. So um, really a lot of improvements by using tools such as these. Um, with that, I really do want to thank you for your time. We want to leave a lot of time for questions, uh, but I did want to leave you with a few resources. Again, we will share this recording. We will share this presentation. As you can see, everything here has live links, so you can easily get to the various resources. Kelly will make sure all of this is put up onto the GeoNet community pages for statistics. Um, so with that, I am going to stop talking, and we are going to throw it open for questions. All right, thank you, Linda. And it looks like we do have some questions here from the audience. So again, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and type them into that, that chat window and we'll get through as many as we can in this Q&A session. So this first question, um, Kate, I believe this one is yours. So how many hours did it take to create the underlying data points from the map? So running the extract or the detect objects using deep learning tool to get to the building polygons, uh, for Grenada it took about 40 hours, but it'll totally depend on the size of your area uh, that you're trying to run it on. And then going from the building polygons to the building points just took uh, about a minute. Got it, great, thank you, Kate. And Linda, I think this next question I will throw to you. 
One of the requirements of my project is to do the webinar deep learning example. Is there a tutorial to reproduce that example? Yeah, we've got a lot of great learn lessons and I did put a link to learn within the resources page there, but there's some very specific lessons in there on uh, feature extraction and, and deep learning. And I'll just jump in on that one. We also have a blog series that goes through exactly how to set up your uh, machine hardware and get everything you need to run those tools and then what all the different input parameters are and how to uh, set those based on your input data. Great, thank you both. Um, let's see, the next set of questions, so Matt, I will throw this one your way, uh, and it looks like it's a two-part, it's a little lengthy, so um, I think this one is addressing boundaries. So the question from our audience member, surely you want to use water as a boundary, and then as a follow-up to that, also access to the E8 areas, is that a consideration? For example, how do people get there? Are they leaving roads to walk across open territory to get to a building? which might be better placed in another EA that had more direct access to it. It would also be useful to hear how this works with existing EA boundaries and how it can minimize, sorry, it's cutting off here, minimize the redrawing of those boundaries. Yes, those are all, those are all great questions. So uh, yeah, absolutely. So I guess as far as I'll start with the, um, the barriers question, first um, in this case in the general area that I was working on there weren't any major drainage issues uh, or hydro lines that were, would affect my territory but that is a good point like so if I wanted if I had a, a series of islands right Grenada is an archipelago I could use the ocean boundaries to stop the growth of my EA so that way they wouldn't be you know launching across uh, the different islands um, and then it's the uh, same with the the road network if I had one that was set up to, you know, call out major highways or denote the bridges, I could use all of those as growth barriers. So people aren't walking across open territory to get to the next enumeration area. We have to follow some sort of road road network um, if that's what you want. Uh, and then going into the existing enumeration areas, those can be loaded into the territory solution as well and then be modified or rebalanced. So in this case, I was starting with with no areas, but you, like I said, you can import your previous enumeration areas, whether they be digitized or not, uh, and then have the, the variables applied to them, and then be redrawn. Um, I, is that everything? I would also just add that we can have multiple levels in the territory design solution. So if you wanted to break up your uh, demarcation enumeration areas just into smaller subsets you could just set them as different levels so that any enumeration areas could just fit up into the existing uh, demarcation areas got it perfect yeah. thank you both um, all right this next question I uh, Kate I believe I will throw this one over to you how do you force ranges so for example age should be something like zero to a reasonable age, not zero to a million. So we can definitely do that in the XLS form when you're setting up the questions. You could either set it so that there's just an upper limit to the number that you can put in. You can also set limits to the number of digits you can include in the answer. So if you only wanted to be able to put three numbers in your age answer, you could set it that way or you could set the range specifically of 0 to 100 so that you can do in the XLS form. And there's really excellent documentation online for um, all of the different parameters you can have for configuring XLS forms for Survey123. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. And as a follow-up to that, um, and Matt or Kate, I will throw this over to you. I think when you were filling out the form, they had a question of if you had to enter an age at all. I don't know if that was something just not included in the form or if that wasn't a requirement in this case. Right. Yeah, so form, as part of the form, oh, go ahead, Kate. Yeah, just quickly, um, you can set any of the questions as required. So in our case, just for demoing it, we left it so we wouldn't have to click every single answer, but you can absolutely set it so you have to fill out every question. You can also set some questions so that you can't um, you can't change them. So if I had those parish building number ED numbers, I can set it so that the enumerator can view them but not change them. 
Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Matt, I'm sharing my screen here. Uh, this that's the there's a field inside the form called required, and if you want to make sure that someone has to submit an answer to that question, you'll set this as yes. Perfect. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that. Um, and then very quickly from that same audience member, what kind of device are you running this on? And sorry if she missed that, Matt, I think she was referring to uh, the mobile device you were sharing. Sure, so yeah, my mobile device happens to be an iPhone. Um, I believe Kate was running an Android. Uh, and then I also have another example, we're running it from a Galaxy Tab. So it's basically device agnostic. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you for the clarification. And Kate, this next question I will throw to you. Is it possible to include in the form different validations for an easy example that a person doesn't respond that has 160 years? And I'm not and if that's not clarified, we can ask for for them to clarify. Yeah, I'm guessing that that's the same thing with not saying your age is outside of a realistic range. Right. Like I mentioned before. Um, one other thing I could add, if you want to specify a specific format for an answer, you could also do that. So if you wanted to specify that they're inputting a phone number, uh, you can set it so that it'll show as three numbers, a dash, three numbers, a dash, and then four numbers. And it won't uh, accept any answer that's not submitted in that specific format. Great, thank you. And Linda, we have a, a question for you here. I have a customer who has restrictions on data being stored and processed outside the country. Uh, in my case, Brazil, what do you recommend? My organization already has a license from Esri, and we are going to be in the field in October. We are working on the questionnaires and intend to compete, or sorry, complete the planning phase in August. Yeah, sure. Um, we see this in a lot of different countries. So um, I would look at first, uh, you know, is there a, a commercial provider with a cloud in country, um, Microsoft or Amazon, for example, I believe both have uh, cloud services within Brazil. So that could be a, a good option for you. Um, oftentimes also we see the, the large telcos offer cloud hosting services. So since you have your licenses, you could bring your own license to them and say I want to set this up into a cloud environment. But we're happy to, to uh, give you some uh, direction on that directly as well if needed. Matt, I don't know of anything you want to add that I missed. Uh, no, that pretty much sums it up. Um, I mean, we can we have different ways of deploying the ArcGIS system. Um, so if the requirement is that it is inside the territory but you still want to work on the cloud, uh, we can we can work around that. Perfect, thank you both. And it looks like we have a couple questions asking about uh, whether or not this is being recorded and if we will be providing that recording. Uh, we will be providing the recording for everyone to watch at, later, at a later date, um, or if you wanna share this with your colleagues. We will also be providing any of the resource links that you saw on the slides. So you'll wanna keep an eye out in your email um, for the location of that recording. You will also have the ability to ask additional questions too. So whatever we don't get to today, um, that recording will be posted in our Esri Statistics community page, and you have the ability there to um, create a quick account and ask our team any additional questions. So again, thank you for everything that's coming in. I think we have time for a few more, and whatever we don't get to, we will address later on. Uh, so let's see, Matt, I believe this next question is for you. ArcGIS Survey123 includes the images for different, oh, it's a question. Does ArcGIS 123 include the images for different territories, or do we have to get the images to use them into ArcGIS? Um, so it's my understanding that question is re referring to the imagery that we showed to do the feature extraction. Um, so th that's not included with ArcGIS Survey 123 specifically. Uh, those images were collected by the government of Grenada um, with high resolution satellite um, photography. So they, they captured that and they let us use that for this demonstration. Uh, we do have some image services that can be used, uh, like Worldview 2, which should provide a pretty decent resolution to do some building extraction from. Um, but you can also use, you know, aerial photography, you can use a uh, high resolution satellite. So I guess the answer to that question, long story short, is it's not included in Survey123, but it is part of the ArcGIS platform but you can also bring in your own imagery. Perfect, thank and you. And if you're just looking, 
And if you're just looking to have imagery underneath when you're looking at the building points in Survey123, we have an imagery base map uh, that's really available that has imagery for the whole world. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, see, this next question, Linda, I will throw this one over to you. The team is still dependent on ArcMap, and I'm trying to encourage the migration to ArcGIS Pro. Are there any other examples and tutorials on integrating field tools with ArcGIS Pro? Yeah, yeah, great question. Again, um, there are a lot of really great learn lessons. And in fact, we have a new learn hub for official statistics uh, going live this week. And included in that, we have some migrate to pro lessons. So um, I'll be sure to share that link with Kelly that, that she will share out with everyone with this recording. So uh, take a look there, but lots of good lessons. Perfect, thank you. And the next question, Kate, I believe this one is for you. How can you use the ArcGIS deep learning tools to overcome this challenge? And I'm not sure what challenge they're referring to, so we need clarification. I, think I saw ask. the rest of that question further down. Let's see. The list. Yeah, I think that had to do with e-cognition. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's a, there's a follow-up question. I have used eCognition software extensively and developed algorithms for training imagery, but spectral signatures of building roofs are often confused, such as asphalt roofs with asphalt roads. How can you use ArcGIS deep learning tools to overcome this challenge? There we go. That's the full, the full question. So an advantage of using our deep learning models, especially the pre-trained out-of-the-box ones, is they've been trained already on so much data, way more than you'd be able to create on your own just drawing building rooftops. And in addition, it's not just going off of the spectral signatures. So with land, like land cover classification, it's just looking at the pixels themselves. But with the deep learning model, it's also taking into account the shape and additional context. So a long road is going to look different than one rectangular building rooftop. So it does a lot better than other out-of-the-box tools um, that are just going to be looking at spectral signatures um, for doing building rooftop extraction. Perfect. Thank you. And while I have you on deck here, Kate, is it possible to import existing data from previous censuses? Yeah, you can bring in uh, previous data and bring that into a feature service. So I was showing, or so Matt was showing when he was loading in um, when he was opening up a building point on the map that had already had the data that had been collected in the building survey that I did, but you could just as easily create a feature service from a previous survey and have that data to load in to update. Um, any data you have, you could bring into a feature service and use that as your starting point. Perfect, thank you. And I think we have time for one or two more here. And again, we'll try and get to as much as we can, whatever we don't get to, uh, today in the live session we can address um, in the in the recording post on the Esri community page. Uh, so Matt, I believe this one's for you. Is there any source for villages with name in each country? Um, so I guess uh, one, one source that I have found that actually works pretty well for this uh, is Wikipedia. Uh, a lot of them have a listing of villages or cities within side of a territory. Uh, but as far as I know, there's no um, like one main source to list all the villages within within a country, kind of right. case by case basis. Yeah, I mean, if you look at our living atlas, um, this is where we look to you and the community to also contribute your information. Um, there is uh, boundary information at administrative level one and two. But once you get lower than that, it really is dependent upon the countries to publish that authoritative data um, as a layer. Perfect. Thank you. And I, we have time for one more, so I'll make this the last question and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, so Matt, I believe this one will be for you. Is it possible to extract or link the data with an external database? And this user needs to deliver the results to a government agency that uses PostGIS or Postgres? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're running everything on feature services for this demo, but those services could also be um, a Postgres database. Um, in fact, the uh, fun fact, if you didn't know this already, the um, data store in RTS Online is a Postgres database. So um, 
yeah, you can link the data with external. You can use your uh, uh, online data store. Uh, you can use file databases. Um, pretty much however you'd like to work, you can connect to the services in that way. Great, thank you. And that will be it for our Q&A session today and our presentations. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, in our webinar today. And thank you for all your participation, both in the poll questions and with all the great questions here. Um, again, just as a reminder, this has been recorded. And you will receive an email with a link to that recording location, plus any of the additional resources and links that you saw on our slides. So we will make all of that available to you within the next couple of days. Um, that email should go out to the same one that you registered for this webinar with uh, so that way you can watch at a later date and share with your colleagues and again if you have any additional questions you do have the ability to post those questions to our team here uh, through our Esri community page um, so again thank you all for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day thank you yeah thanks everyone